Okay, uh, hi year five and six. This is Mr. Harris here, and uh, this is your reading lesson for uh, summer term week one, the first lesson. And we're going to be starting a new book today, which uh, I'm going to read part of, and you can also read as well because I've got the PDF copy up here. Um, so I'm just going to talk through uh, a couple of bits. So I need to share my screen first, so hopefully you can see everything. Right, so first of all, as I said, we'll be uh, sharing this book over the next few weeks. It's uh, Back Beauty by Anna Sewell. Um, and today we're going to be reading chapters one and two, or parts one and two. Um, a bit of vocabulary that might um, be useful for you to know. There's a grove of fir trees, which you can see there. Uh, a brook is a small screen. Uh, they mentioned colt, which is like a, a baby baby male horse uh, or also known as a foal and there's also a hare which I'd imagine you know anyway from the old fable the tortoise and the hare. So anyway without further ado I'm going to start reading these uh, first few pages. Now children you can listen to me doing this as I scroll along or of course you can read it yourself. Um, we can put the link in for these texts as they are free online and able to be shared so it's up to you how you do it um, but there'll be some questions for you to answer after this okay so black beauty by Anna Sewell chapter one my early home the first place that I can well remember was a large pleasant meadow with a pond of clear water in it some shady trees leaned over it and rushes and water lilies grew at the deep end over the hedge on one side we looked into a ploughed field, and on the other, we looked over a gate at our master's house, which stood by the roadside. At the top of the meadow was a grove of fir trees, and at the bottom, a running brook overhung by a steep bank. While I was young, I lived upon my mother's milk, as I could not eat grass. In the daytime, I ran by her side, and at night, I lay down close by her. When it was hot, we used to stand by the pond in the shade of the trees and when it was cold we had a nice warm shed near the grove. As soon as I was old enough to eat grass my mother used to go out to work in the daytime and come back in the thick young colts in the meadow beside me. They were older than I was. Some were nearly as large as grown-up horses. I used to run with them and had great fun. We used to gallop all together round and round the fields as hard as we could go. Sometimes we had rather rough play for they they would frequently bite and kick as well as gallop. One day, when there was a good deal of kicking, my mother whinnied to me to come to her, and then she said, I wish you to pay attention to what I am going to say to you. The colts who live here are very good colts, but they are cart horse colts, and of course they have not learned manners. You have been well bred and well born. Your father has a great name in these parts and your grandfather won the cup two years at the Newmarket races. Your grandmother had the sweetest temper of any horse I ever knew, and I think you have never seen me kick or bite. I hope you will grow up gentle and good and never learn bad ways. Do your work with a good will. Lift your feet up well when you trot and never bite or kick, even in play. I have never forgotten my mother's advice. I knew she was a wise old horse, and our master thought a great deal of her. Her name was Duchess, but he often called her Pet. Our master was a good, kind man. He gave us good food, good lodging, and kind words. As kindly to us as he did to his little children. We were all fond of him, and my mother loved him very much. When she saw him at the gate, she would neigh with joy and trot up to him. He would pat and stroke her and say, Well, old Pet, and how is your little darky? I was a dull black, so he, he called me darky. Then he would give me a piece of bread, which was very good, and sometimes he bought a carrot for my mother. All the horses would come to him, but I think we were his favourites. My mother always took him to the town on a market day in a light jig. There was a ploughboy, Dick, who sometimes came into our field to pluck, pluck blackberries from the hedge. 
When he had eaten all he wanted, he would have what he called fun with the colts, throwing stones and sticks at them to make them gallop. We did not much mind him, for we could gallop off, but sometimes a stone would hit and hurt us. One day he was at this game and did not know that the master was in the next field, but he was there watching what was going on. Over the hedge he jumped in a snap and catching Dick by the arm, he gave him such a box on the ear as made him roar with the pain and surprise. As soon as we saw the master, we trotted up nearer to see what went on. Bad boy, he shouted, bad boy to chase the colts. This is not the first time, nor the second, but it shall be the last. Here, take your money and go home. I shall not meet you on my farm again. So he never said it anymore. Old Daniel, the man who looked after the horses, was just as gentle as our master, so we were well off. Chapter 2. The Hunt. Before I was two years old, a circumstance happened, which I have never forgotten. It was early in the spring. There had been a little frost in the night, and a light mist still hung over the woods and meadows. I and the other colts were feeding at the lower part of the field when we heard, quite in the distance, it sounded like the cry of dogs. The oldest of the colts raised his head, he pricked his ears, and said, There are the hounds, and immediately cantered off, followed by the rest of us to the upper part of the field, where we could look over the hedge and see several fields beyond. My mother and an old riding horse of our masters were also standing near and seemed to know all about it. They have found a hare, said my mother, and if they come this way, shall we, we shall see the hunt. And soon the dogs were all tearing down the field of young wheat next to ours. I never heard such a noise as they made. They did not bark, nor howl, nor whine, but kept on a yo, yo, oh, oh, yo, yo, oh, oh, at the top of their voices. After them came a number of men on horseback, some of them in green coats, all galloping as fast as they could. The old horse snorted and looked eagerly after them, and we young colts wanted to be ga galloping with them, but they were soon away into the fields, looking as if they had come to a stand. The dog left off barking and ran about every way with their noses to the ground. They have lost the scent, said the old horse. Perhaps the hare will get off. What hare? I said. Oh, I don't know all what hare? Likely enough, it may be one of our own hares out of the woods. Any hare they can find will do for the dogs and men to run after. And before long, the dogs began their yo o o again, and back they came, all together at full speed, making straight for our meadow at the part where the high bank and hedge overhang the brook. Now we shall see the hare, said my mother, and just then a hare, wild with fright, rushed by and made for the woods. On came the dogs. They burst over the bank, leaped the stream, and came dashing across the field, followed by the huntsmen. Six or eight men leaped their horses clean over, close upon the dogs. The hare tried to get through the fence. It was too thick, and she turned sharp round to make for the road, but it was too late. The dogs were upon her with their wild cries. We heard one shriek, and that was the end of her. One of the huntsmen rode up and whipped off the dogs, who would soon have torn her to pieces. He held her up by the leg, torn and bleeding, and all the gentlemen seemed well pleased. As for me, I was so astonished that I did at first see what was going on by the brook. But when I did look, there was a sad sight. Two fine horses were down. One was struggling in the stream, and the other was groaning on the grass. One of the riders was getting out of the water covered with mud. The other lay quite still. His neck is broke, said my mother mother and serve him right too said one of the colts i thought the same but my mother did not join us well no she said it's not to say that but though i am an old horse and have seen and heard a great deal i never yet could make out why men are so fond of this sport they often hurt themselves often spoil good horses and tear up the fields when all for a hare or a fox or a stag that they could get more easily some other way but we we are only horses, and I don't know. While my mother was saying this, we stood and looked on. Many of the riders had gone to the young man, but my master, who had been watching what was going on, was the first to raise him. His head fell back and his arms hung down, and everyone looked very serious. There was no noise now. 
Even the dogs were quiet and seemed to know that something was wrong. They carried him to our master's house. I heard afterward that it was young George Gordon, the squire's only son, a fine, tall young man and the pride of his family. There was now riding off in all directions to the doctors, to the farriers, and no doubt to Squire Gordon's to let him know about his son. When Mr Bond, the farrier, came to look at the black horse that lay groaning on the grass, he felt him all over and shook his head. One of his legs was broken. Then someone ran to our master's house and came back with a gun. Presently there was a loud bang, bang and a dreadful shriek, and then all was still. The black horse moved no more. My mother seemed much troubled. She said she had known owned that horse for years and that his name was Rob Roy. He was a good horse and there was no vice in him. She never would go to that part of the field afterwards. Not many days after we heard the church bell tolling for a long time and looking over the gate we saw a long strange black coach that was covered with black cloth and was drawn by black horses. After that came another and another and another and all were black while the bell kept tolling, tolling. They were carried Carrying young Gordon to the churchyard to bury him. He would never ride again. What they did with Rob Roy, I never knew, but twas all for one little hair. Okay, children, so that's the end of chapter two. Um, there's a few retrieval questions for you to answer. So uh, you can either do them here and you can pause the um, video and answer them on a piece of paper and you can send them through to the year five or year six email address or uh, preferably you can do it on purple mash because I have set up a quiz which you'll be able to find in your to do's so I'll just show you that now that will be up as of the day and you in for Friday oh, that shows you the answers but you can see that the uh, questions are here for you to do on your purple mash. So uh, your teacher will be able to see that you've answered those questions. Um, if you've done that, then there are some optional additional questions. Um, as with the retrieval questions, uh, you can answer them on the blog. Your teacher can say whether you've got them right. Or you can email it to the year six or year five email address, which is on your screen now. That um, can even take a photo on a mobile phone from someone at home who's got a mobile phone and they can just send it across. So there's some inference questions there. So again, if you want to answer those, you can just pause the video and answer them. And finally, there's an art activity which um, we've done in year five and six before. Basically, I'd like you to um, draw the scene, uh, the setting description that comes in the first paragraph of the book, um, which I've just written on the bottom of the smart board there. Remember, children, that is an optional activity if you've done the retrieval questions, um, but it would be great to see some of them come through to the year five or six email address because then we can share and celebrate those things. OK, that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed the first chapters or the first two chapters um i thought the second chapter was quite a powerful ending by the author really got her attention from that first um description of their life um with with the master and how it's a nice life for the horses followed by that quite um those quite shocking events of the uh of the hunt but let me know what you think okay i'm gonna stop recording this now have a good day everyone bye